Um, I'm going to, when I talk about this story, uh, refer to some uh, objects uh, which we associate with Christmas, uh, three traditional uh, objects. Um, and the first one is a present, okay, a present. We all are looking forward to presents. I know my Daniela uh, is looking forward uh, to her presents. In fact, when I once traveled to India uh, to do some uh, preaching ministry there, um, I came back after 10 days and the first thing she said was, Daddy, have you brought me a present? <laughs> uh, there was nothing about, uh, Daddy, I'm so glad you've come home. <laughs> but you see, this was a very surprising present, wasn't it, uh, for Mary, uh, when this angel appeared, this amazing gift. And I want to just emphasize that it was a gift, um, because when the angel came in, in verse 28, the angel called, he said to Mary, you who are highly favored. And then later in verse 30, he said, you who have found favor with God. Now, some people think that's because Mary was a wonderful woman. And I'm sure she was uh, a lovely lady, but it wasn't anything uh, that she had done to make her deserve this. It was a present. It was what we call grace. There was no room for pride. Uh, you know, some people can get really uh, proud about their sons or daughters. Well, there was no room for pride. The angel quenched that. He said, uh, you have found favor with God. And really, the word is grace, a free bestowal of grace. And that is what the Lord has done in our lives. He has come sh through sheer grace uh, to stoop down to us in our need. And uh, it was a gift. But here's something that I really felt we should take notice of. It says in verse 29 uh, that Mary uh, was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And um, you see, sometimes I want to make this point. Sometimes grace can come to us in frightening forms uh, and even perplex us. You know, the Lord might be trying to bless you, uh, but it might be in a very strange way. Um, here's an example. Uh, maybe grace can sometimes come when things go wrong in our lives or when we uh, are rejected or when suffering comes our way. Um, you see, you have to understand that when the angel said this to Mary, I think she got it. She understood that when the angel said you're going to have a son, she didn't think, oh, yeah, yeah, when I get married to Joseph, yeah, yeah, of course we'll have a son. Yeah, that's great. Look, that's great, Mr. Angel. She didn't think that. She realized the angel was saying, you're going to have a son who, with no earthly father. And it was frightening because what would people think? They would think Mary's been sleeping around. Uh, she could lose her dreams of nice Joseph. She could lose Joseph. Joseph will divorce her. These nice dreams of having a nice little family, a nice little home, all going out the window. I mean, talk about bearing the cross. You know, this was a frightening form of grace. But she trusted the Lord. And I just want to encourage you that sometimes God may be seeking to bless you through something that looks frightening, uh, that something that maybe looks perplexing. Um, sometimes through rejection, other doors open. You know, grace can take uh, frightening forms, uh, but if we trust the Lord, sometimes you'll find he's actually trying to bless you through what seems strange or difficult. And I'd encourage you to be open to God seeking to minister through uh, these sorts of things. But of course, it was a very surprising present, particularly uh, because she says, doesn't she? She says, how will this be uh, since I am a virgin? You know, uh, you know, she could have said to the angel, Mr. Gabriel, you know, you do realize, don't you, that you need a man and a woman for this sort of thing. You know, I, I'm a virgin. Uh, how can this be? And miraculous birth, it was not something unknown to the nation of Israel. Um, you know, they, in fact, their whole nation was founded on Isaac. You know, Isaac, the miraculous uh, son given to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. And they prided themselves on being descendants uh, of, of Abraham through Isaac. So miraculous birth in itself wasn't particularly uh, unheard of. You also have the story of uh, Jacob and Rachel. 
you know, when Rachel was a barren for a long time and said, give me children or I die. <laughs> and eventually God gave her children. Uh, you also have the story of Hannah wanting uh, a son. You know, she prayed and wept at the temple before Eli, uh, wanting that baby boy that she promised to give to the Lord. And eventually the Lord listened and the prophet, one of the first of the greatest prophets um, arose called Samuel. And of course, what we saw uh, a couple of weeks or last week, in fact, the birth of John the Baptist was, was miraculous, really, because Zechariah and Elizabeth were very old. But the difference here, obviously, is that in all those cases, there was a man involved. Uh, whereas in Mary's case, there is no earthly man. It's the virgin uh, birth. So she's obviously asking, you know, how can this be? This was the novelty. It wasn't so much the birth that was miraculous, actually. Um, you know, Jesus was born pretty normally like every other baby, but it was the conception. It was the way that he was conceived. No human being on the father's side involved at all. How can this be? So uh, he came from outside the human race, uh, Jesus. Now, on the earthly line, he uh, followed David's line. You know, it was all prophesied throughout the Bible that a son of David would come, someone in David's royal line. And you see, Joseph, though not his actual father, was, on, in the earthly sense, legally, Joseph was legally his dad. And that made Jesus join the line of David. You see, Joseph was descended from the Davidic line. So when Jesus was born from heaven, he became part of David's line because Joseph was his legal dad, but he wasn't his real dad. Jesus came from outside. Okay, and I just want to say these uh, three things to you. Jesus, uh, pretty basic stuff this morning, but it's important we hear it. Jesus is God's present. Uh, he's the present that came from outside. And he's the present uh, that we desperately need. Okay. Uh, the Lord's birth was an advent. He came from outside. He didn't rise up through the human race. And uh, I want to show you an illustration to help explain this, I hope, a bit better now. I don't know if you recognize uh, that photograph, um, <laughs> uh, but that, that is a Blackwater estuary um, near a place called Malden. Uh, and it's uh, very muddy. And what happens is it gets very, very deep in some parts uh, and very muddy. And there are signs uh, that are put up um, warning people uh, to not cross the mud. But people still uh, cross the mud uh, despite the signs. They ignore them. And um, if you go too deep, you can end up uh, sinking even to your waist. Um, and being stuck, and then you need uh, rescue. Uh, there is even, uh, some once a year, um, something called the Molden Mud Race. I don't know if any of you <laughs> have ever done this. Um, uh, but you see, people cross the, the, the mud, and then they end up getting uh, stuck, uh, and they need rescue. And sometimes they have to call out one of these guys. An air rescue helicopter who can send in somebody who is not covered in mud, who can send in somebody from above, <laughs> somebody who is not stuck in a mud hole, somebody who has not jumped down into the mud. And you may be asking, why am I telling you this stuff? Well, Jesus Christ uh, never uh, jumped down into the mud, he never sinned. I'm using this as a picture. He was someone who never jumped down into the mud. He was someone who was never covered in mud. Uh, you see, the whole human race did jump down into the mud. You know, uh, when Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden made that faith uh, transaction with Satan, basically it says in Romans that we, uh, we were sold uh, to sin. And the question arises, well, who sold us? Well, Adam. Adam sold out the human race 
to the devil in the Garden of Eden. It was a, it was a transaction. And he knew exactly what he was doing, which is the horrific thing. And I don't know whether you believe the doctrine of original sin, but that is what is taught in the Bible, that everyone coming from Adam is muddy. Everyone who has Adam as their uh, original ancestor is stuck in the mud. So you need someone to come from outside who is not of that muddy line. And that is why Jesus came as, as a, from above through a virgin birth, because he, if he had been born of Adam's descendancy, Jesus would have been a sinner like the rest of us. He had to come from outside. You see, people who say the virgin births all made up, they're not thinking logically. See, logically, if you're going to bring a saviour who's, who's, who's free from the sin of Adam, you need, to come, you need to start again from a different source. And that is why Jesus came uh, into uh, to, to, to basically start a new race of people. All those who put their faith in Christ can become a new creation with a new spiritual ancestry cut off uh, you can be cut off from your old adam uh, heritage that downstream that download that we are all born with that comes from adam so that's why the virgin birth makes perfect logical sense to me uh, even though it's i mean for god it's not a problem to do so i've talked about a present and it's a special present from outside this is why Christmas changes everything, because our, uh, our, our past can be changed and we can start afresh. The second little um, item I'd like to talk to you about is the crown. You know, you get a crown um, in Christmas crackers, don't you? Uh, I trust when you open your Christmas crackers uh, this year, uh, you know, you'll get this little silly paper crown. And I think the crown um, is there because it remembers perhaps the wise men as well. Uh, but I don't know if you noticed in the readings that Ray read, there's a lot about kingliness in the verses uh, that the angel spoke to Mary. Here's some examples. I mean, you ask yourself, how many words to do with being a king can you spot in verses 32 to 33? And I've listed them on the screen there. Um, he says, I mean, these are words associated with kingliness. He says, the angel says, he will be great in verse 32. Um, uh, now, Jesus will be, is great. <clears throat> um, and by the way, <clears throat> if you are ashamed of this great Jesus, can I just say something? Uh, you are like a candle that is ashamed of the sun. <laughs> You know, I've put a picture there on the screen of a little candle next to the blazing sun. If you are ashamed of Jesus, it's like a candle being ashamed of the sun. Because Jesus is great. He is tremendously great. And the angel also said he will be called the son of the most high. Now, son of the most high was also a kingly title, sometimes given to kings in ancient Israel, um, according to some of my studies. So again, you've got a kind of kingly reference, but he is the son of the most high of God. You've got the word throne in verse 32, and you've also got the mention again, as I said, of David. He's born into the David line. Uh, and then in verse 33, it talks about a reign and it talks about his kingdom will never end. So <clears throat> when you um, at Christmas see a paper crown, I want you to remember that this is... God's uh, forever, long ago promised king, God's forever king promised throughout the Bible, the one who will defeat all the enemies of God and the enemies in your life. Now, when Jesus went around doing miracles, you have to understand that they were a sneak preview um, of what will be one day. What I mean by that is things that afflict us now, like death, uh, sickness, evil spirits, chaos, disorder, turbulence in the nations, all those things, Jesus will one day sweep away. And in the Gospels, we get a, a snapshot. You see, I've got a picture of a, a camera there uh, and a, 
of also, uh, if it's not a snapshot, it's like a film trailer. We get a film trailer of what's to come, of this king who can defeat and will defeat all the enemies of God and all the enemies in your life. Um, I've also put a picture on there of someone glimpsing through a hole. Because you see, the Gospels are a glimpse of what this king can do. Jesus has proved, he has proved what he can do as king. And this king uh, was born at Christmas. And this is why Christmas changes everything, because the enemies have had uh, their, no their eviction notice has been served. OK, we still see now death, disease, sickness, and the cynical people will say, yeah, but what's changed? Well, the eviction notice has been served and Jesus has proved that he can defeat all of God's enemies. And one day he will sweep them all away. It is written in the scripture. Just as it was promised Jesus would come at Christmas, it's promised he will come again. And it happened the first time and is true. And it's going to happen again the second time is true. So when you open your cracker and see your little gold crown, think of the king. <laughs> That's why things have changed. Satan is no longer... Uh, running around doing exactly what he wants. He's still got, yeah, he's still, Satan is like a chicken that's had his head cut off, you know? Um, a chicken, when you cut its head off, not that I've done that, I understand it runs around in a frenzy for a long time before it drops dead. Satan is like that. He has had, the cross has dealt with him. He's had the eviction notice served and Jesus has proved it. And the clock is now ticking. For us, it may seem a long time, but... Uh, so please understand that Jesus proved he was the king who was stronger than all the enemies. Uh, you know, when it was sickness, um, he had authority. He healed uh, those who were sick. Uh, when he came up against a natural disaster, like uh, on the Sea of Galilee, you know, there was a storm. Uh, and it was a serious storm because even the professional fishermen like Peter and James and John, they were terrified. It was something quite serious and Jesus was stronger than that. And that is a picture of how this king has authority over chaos and over evil forces and over turbulence of the nations. You know, at the moment, the nations are in turmoil, aren't they? With the COVID and with what's going on in America, you know, who's the right president? Uh, the, the things are in turmoil. But Jesus uh, is the king who will one day bring these things under and to heal. Evil spirits, he cast out evil spirits, didn't he? Went around mopping them up after defeating Satan in the wilderness, in the temptations. He, he bound the strong man in the, the wilderness. He bound the strong man, which is the devil, and he then went around mopping up his lesser demons. And Jesus also has defeated death. Yes, we still die at the moment, but you see in the Gospels, he raised the widow, the widow's son, from the village of Nain. He raised Jairus's daughter. He raised Lazarus, who was rotting after four days of being in the grave. And Jesus himself rose. And then in the book of Acts, through Peter and through Paul, other people were raised from the dead by Jesus Christ. So one day, all enemies will be swept away. This is the king we desperately need. He's the only one who can meet our deepest problem and defeat our enemies. And he's the one uh, who can get us out of the mud hole. <laughs> this is why Christmas changes everything. Now, my last uh, little image is the Advent calendar. The Advent calendar. Now, <clears throat> I hope you're still with me. Uh, <laughs> the Advent calendar, there are two types, uh, well, three types of Advent calendar. One uh, is the one with uh, chocolates in it. Uh, uh, and, you know, I could tell you a joke about that. Just let me tell you this joke very quickly. <laughs> Someone said, I'm angry. I've just got home and found all my windows open. They've stolen everything. Those thieves. What kind of selfish person would do that to another person? Especially with Christmas right round the corner. That was my advent calendar. <laughs> they had no right to open all the windows and steal all my chocolates. <laughs> so... That's one kind of advent calendar. Now, the other kind of advent calendar is the one with pictures in it. I want you to remember this. Pictures, you know, uh, you get a picture in the advent calendar. Uh, and I want to suggest to you that this story that we've read 
about uh, the angel appearing to Mary is not only a historical account of Christ's birth, it is a picture of something that God does in this present age. It's a picture of something. Um, before I go any further on that, there's another kind of advent calendar. So we've done, you know, the chocolate one, the pictures one. There's also one that my wife does. Um, my wife has um, these little wooden houses, uh, one for each day of advent. And when you get to it, you open the house and inside there is a promise. Uh, this uh, was a promise that my children found yesterday. It's a promise to the children uh, that they will do something on that day. And uh, that promise was fulfilled. Um, <laughs> Pancakes. We promised to make pancakes with them, and we did. And there's Rebecca's pancake. Um, and I want to suggest to you, though, uh, <clears throat> the, what I'm saying on the screen here. Let me read it to you. This scene in Luke 1, 26, 38, is a true historical record of how Jesus was conceived. But it is not only that. It is also a picture, you know, like in the Advent calendar, and a promise, like in the Advent houses of the way God brings people to new birth in this present age of grace and truth. It shows how people can conceive Jesus by faith. Um, I'll try and explain what I mean. In the passage that Ray read, uh, we read of a heavenly messenger, don't we? That's Angel Gabriel, uh, a heavenly messenger. Well, <clears throat> In this current age, who is the heavenly messenger? Well, may I suggest to you, it's the preacher. <laughs> um, when I say heavenly messenger, I mean someone who is sent by God to preach the gospel. Now, OK, a human being comes from earth, but if they are born of God, uh, filled with the spirit, in a sense, they are a heavenly being as well. And I believe this is a picture. Well, I know it's a picture of that's when someone is sent to proclaim the gospel. Uh, in verse 26, the angel was sent uh, to Nazareth, to Mary. And then in the second point, the word of God, verse 31, it says in verse 31, it, the angel proclaims the word. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call his name Jesus that is a picture of the proclamation of the gospel about Jesus. So you've got someone sent bringing the gospel. You've got the gospel being proclaimed, the word of God. And then you have what happens in verse 35. The angel says, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. When the gospel is preached, this overshadowing of the spirit can really, it's almost like God's wings are protecting you from listening to all the lies of the world. And God is singling you out for salvation. I've had it happen to me. If you think I'm making all this up. <laughs> when I was at Exeter University, I heard the gospel and it was as though God was singling me out. He was overshadowing me with, he was putting me up against the wall. And the word of God was coming directly to me saying, Simon, make your choice. And it's almost like the Lord uh, sent a, a missionary. I remember hearing a missionary. It was almost like he was sent to preach to me. And then it says the Holy Spirit will come with power. And you know that the word power is the same word in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, it says... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And when I was at Exeter University and I came and I heard the gospel and, and I believed on Jesus Christ, it was all about Jesus, the death on the cross, Jesus, it, the Holy Spirit came. And I remember in the top hall uh, of Marden Hall, third floor uh, in, was it 1991 or something like, yeah, 1991, Filled with joy, filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came. But it takes power to bring forth a child of God. It takes power. And I believe the incarnation that we read about here 
is setting a pattern of how people are born again when they believe on the Lord. But there's one last element in this picture, and that is Mary's response. You see, Mary, uh, beautiful words. She says in verse 38, um, may your words to me be fulfilled, or I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. Um, some versions say, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it to me according to your word. And you need to have someone who is willing who uh, will cooperate, who will surrender humbly to the gospel. That's a very simple point. Um, so I'm going to finish by asking a challenge. Can you say this like Mary? Can you say, let the Holy Spirit do with me as he pleases? You know, Christmas changes everything because the great king has come, the present who gets us out of the mud. Christmas changes everything because he's the king who can meet our deepest need and defeat our enemies. And Christmas changes everything because the Lord has inaugurated this uh, pattern and picture of new birth. This, it's not just Jesus. Jesus didn't just come, get born and go back to heaven. He came, died for us and made it possible for all of us to be born again. Um, now, most of you or all of you are Christians already, I know. So you might think, well, that's a bit simple. But the challenge I want to leave with you is Mary's response. Let the Holy Spirit do with me as he pleases. We all need to be like Mary. And one last thing to say before we close. Mary was a virgin. <laughs> now, I'm not saying <laughs> you've got to be a physical virgin, but in your heart, you have to be virgin to God. You've got to look only to him and say, Lord, I am yours. I'm sold out for you. I am virgin to God. I am looking to you as you're my number one. God, Jesus, you're my number one. I am a virgin in that sense. I'm not um, being unfaithful to you, Lord, by getting really mixed up in the world and, and into sin. I am virgin to God. So that was Mary's response uh, to this wonderful present this king, uh, this salvation that came at Christmas. Okay, let's pray uh, and we'll sing our final song in a moment. Lord, we thank you for this uh, tremendous, uh, powerful picture and promise and reality uh, of what we read in Luke chapter one. Um, thank you that you are the present that we desperately need. Thank you that you are the king that we desperately need. And thank you that you have brought in this salvation, this uh, picture and promise for all of mankind. And I pray you'll help us, Lord, help us, help me to be those who surrender and say, Holy Spirit, do with me as you please. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are uh, now going to sing. Um, the uh, last song, uh, which is Holy, Holy, Holy. And that is there because all three members were involved uh, in this birth. The Father, um, there was the Son and the Holy Spirit all involved in the birth of Christ. So we're going to sing Holy, 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 thinking about the Trinity. The Lord bless you. Amen.